Before I begin tonight, I would like to make an announcement. Some of you already know, but when we begin Salem Baptist Church, the fall of 1996, one of the fir first people that ever came to church was Larry Mossman. Larry uh, lived over at the Four Corners area, and uh, Larry passed away last week uh, on the 7th. He had brain cancer, and then he and his family went to the coast over to uh, Hammond, Oregon, if you know where that's at, and to live with his daughter. And uh, he went home to be with the Lord. I have many fond memories of Larry and, and uh, just a wonderful man. So I'd like to begin by having just a word of prayer. If you'd join me to pray for his family, his wife, Mame, his daughter, Heather, and then there is his sons, Mark and Scott. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we've long since learned that if you tarry, that one day they'll call our name that you've called us to be with you. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It happens that fast. On this side of life, there's grieving and there's the heartache of saying goodbye to a loved one. But Lord, on the other side of life, what a, what a joy. Beyond words to exclaim, entering into the presence of the living God, to be with you and Lord, how wonderful that is. Thank you for that hope. The Bible calls it a blessed hope. And so, Lord, tonight we would ask that you would be with Maine. We know, Lord, it's very difficult for her along with her family that God would comfort them and help them and encourage them and just continue to give them wisdom and direction. Thank you for the wonderful help that Larry and Maine were to the beginning days of this church and their, their contribution and wisdom, and we will always remember. So we certainly appreciate them and ask that you would, you would help them now. Help us we, as we undergird them in prayer and ask thy blessings upon them. Lord, tonight we would remember others that uh, are struggling. We ask, Father, that you'd be with a dear pastor friend that we know got hit by a car. And Lord, I just ask that God's healing and mercy and grace would be in his life. Sometimes things are hard to understand why they happen to God's people. But Lord, I just pray that we would continue to be found faithful through the good times and the bad times. God is so very good to us. And Lord, we would pray that you would be with Autumn. We continue to ask that you would course her path and that soon she could be able to uh, be on the field. We know she's prepared and uh, we know that uh, she has siblings that are serving thee in the same uh, continent of Africa. And we're just asking God's blessing and encouragement to rest upon this young lady and her efforts and her family. We ask you to bless her parents. It's not easy, although the year they may be used to their children being away. They are still your children and you miss them. So we ask thy blessings upon them as well. Lord, we pray that you would again, as we have been praying, that you'd bless the effort put forth in this uh, Salem Bible Club this week, that it uh, will continue to yield fruit and open doors of witnessing in people's homes. As Pastor Cox mentioned, that we could have many, many more results of this week. And Lord, we just pray you'd revive and encourage and make God's work go forward in a mighty way Oh, how America needs a revival from God. So, Lord, we earnestly ask it that God's people would love you and passionately serve thee with all their heart. This will make a great difference in this world. Help us now, we pray that you would. Again, help the Mossmans, for Christ's sake we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you'd go with me there this evening, please, for a few moments, I would like to bring a, a message about Christian warfare. Um, the suggestions that people give me uh, as they're many times leaving, I have people say, Pastor, I wish you would speak on. And a lot of times people think I forget those, and sometimes I do. <laughs> but I really do try to capture as many as I can. And this message is a result of someone leaving and saying, Pastor, would you preach on? So I hope that this will be a real help to you. 
by way of introduction, I would like to begin tonight by saying that spiritual warfare is very active, it's very real, it's very serious in the world that we live in. We see more and more the advance of Satan's work and influence in our everyday lives. Satan is gaining more place in the world and Christian influence is uh, being increasingly displaced by it. Uh, as a result, greater and stronger barriers to the gospel are being put up and fortified in defiance of Christ's command to preach the gospel to every nation. Believers uh, very much need to learn the truth about spiritual warfare and discover how to resist the devil so that he is forced to flee, not the Christian. And as, belie as believers do, uh, you need, as a believer, you need to understand you do not have to let the world dictate to you, nor do we have to back backpedal, backpedal from wrong. It's always right to do right. You know, I, based on what we're going to read here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the word stronghold is used. I'll read it to you, of course, in just a minute. A stronghold is a gate or a wrong, uh, wrong, in, wrong enforced by Satan to hold an area yielded to him by a weak or undiscerning Christian. When a believer surrenders to the uh, lust of the flesh or follows the temptation to yield to seducing spirits that teach wrong doctrine, Satan then gains that area in that Christian's life. And though he um, and through that life, he goes farther into the world. In other words, there's less Christian influence and there's more wrong influence because that Christian's not living for Christ in that area. And as this compromise happens in a Christian's life, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. It quenches his work and desire to fulfill his will in your life. And thus, the work of God then does not go forward in the world but Satan's work does. A stronghold is an area that Satan holds under his power in your life. Let's look. Paul was talking about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I'm just going to pick out the verses that we'll be working with. Let's start at verse number 3. The scripture says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Then in parentheses, which is so very important, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of, and there's our, the thought here, strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ." With those few thoughts, I'd like to address you about an area that's not preached on a whole lot, but something that is extremely important. So there's my outline they're going to put up on, and I hope that you'll follow the thoughts here. Just from these three verses, I trust it will help you and inter maybe introduce you to an area of your Christian life that you haven't given much thought. So number one tonight is the fight. Satan uses believers to hinder the gospel. Let me say that again. Satan uses Christians, if they're not ready, if they're not thinking, if they're not uh, walking with the Lord, to hinder the gospel. Keep your finger here, if you would, and just turn back to Matthew chapter 16. It's an it's a, um, illustration that you've read many times, and maybe you've wondered about this, and this is exactly what's happening. Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 21. Uh, before we read this, it's, this is the, where the Peter is, uh, is the, makes the confession that Jesus Christ is, is the rock. And Jesus addressed him as Peter or, or the small rock. You remember the, the story there. And then in verse number 21, something very odd, something very unusual happens. It says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and to suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now, 
If you're thinking these things go together, Jesus told them who he was, what he was going to do. He was empowering them, and he told them how he was going to accomplish this. But verse 22 says, then Peter took. It's very interesting. I don't know exactly what Peter did, but he took him. The implication is that he moved him away from maybe the other, other disciples at that time and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking the God of the universe? How out of step, how wrong that is. Saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I hope you'll catch that in your mind. Now, how is it that a man who had done so much for the Lord and just a few verses earlier here had such a sweet fellowship with the Lord and and acknowledged who he was and then can turn around so very quickly and have something like this happen. Watch what Jesus says. Verse 23, but he, that's Christ, turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me. What's the next word? Satan. You see it in your Bible? Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus knew exactly who he was talking to. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, I want you to understand that had you talked to Peter, he would have said, well, I would have never done that. But Peter was not prepared for the moment that had come. And he was not wanting God's will to be done. He was wanting what Peter thought should happen to Jesus to take place. Here, Satan uses Peter to oppose God's plan and purpose. Satan uses believing people when they allow themselves to be deceived by him, that is, by Satan. These believers are under Satan's influence as they are deceived and And in love and humility, they need to be redirected in their living to the way of, uh, and in their ways and their thinkings, and come back to the thinking of the Lord. You see, Satan has manipulated Christians into wrong thinking and losing their influence in many areas of your life education and entertainment, science, family life, and politics are just a few of the areas held by Satan in many of Christians' lives today. Um, Education and entertainment today promote abortion, which is the shedding, the Bible says, of innocent blood. These promote the so-called gay right agenda, which is opposite of what the Bible teaches. So-called science claims homosexual people are born that way that there are no more just two genders and that unborn babies are not human. Now, this is given to you. It's taught in our schools. It comes over the media all the time. Many politicians use their influence for laws that support evil. They just out and out making laws that are wrong. This is a clear sign that Satan has control of these lawmakers and these facilities that are promoting this, these lies. Satan's strongholds are easily identified. They are where darkness prevails over the mind and hearts of men. You know the verse. It says men love darkness more than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. So this is what we're talking about this evening, and I hope that you'll grasp some of these th- Thoughts, that was our fight. Number two, our enemy. Number two is our enemy. As we look at the verses here in 2 Corinthians 10, we see the first one, according to verse 3, is the flesh or the carnal mind. Let's uh, take another look here at it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So one of our enemies is the flesh. And again, I put down our carnal mind, the, the, this thinking. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. In Romans 8, the Bible says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject unto the law of God, neither indeed can be. The worldly mind is opposed to the mind of the Holy Spirit 
To be carnally minded, the Bible says in Romans 8, is death. So it's very important as we begin to look at how you overcome strongholds, our thinking. Number two, our second uh, enemy is imaginations. Verse number five again says, casting down imaginations. It says, in Genesis chapter six, pre-flood, the Bible says this, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. As you're reading in the Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter six, Jesus, or the Bible lists six things that God hates. Verse 18 says, the heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to run to mischief. In Romans chapter one, Paul describing our age, he said, because that when they knew not God, Excuse me, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Another enemy I see here as we look at this is in verse 5, everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Thoughts, feelings, actions that come from a doubting heart against the word of God. Everything that is moral in our old man seeks to exalt itself. Pride would be an enemy that we need to consider. So what are our weapons? How do we fight against this spiritual warfare? How do we have victory? Well, we're right here. Um, first, the first thought I want you to take a look at is that our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are not carnal. They are not man-made or of human ingenuity spirit spiritual enemies cannot overcome be overcome by material weapons you cannot overcome evil with evil look at verse 4 with me again it says for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds paul in verses 1 and 2 of of uh, this chapter rebukes the corinthians who assumed that Paul was acting according to the flesh, if you go back and look at it. Paul explained that he was at war and his weapons were not carnal but mighty through God. His focus was not on the flesh, but he was about casting down imaginations and everything, uh, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Another thought about our weapons tonight is that they are mighty through God, the text says. Our, whip, our weapons have a very large range and their general purpose is pulling down strongholds. In other words, you have the weapons to be, to be able to redirect the way you think as a Christian so that the devil cannot dictate in your life whatever specific area we might be talking about. Our weapons are mighty because God is the source of their power. His mighty hand is upon them, and with God they bring down unbelief, sin, and yes, Satan himself. Of course, this unbending, never-failing weapon is the word of God in prayer. With these weapons of his uh, truth through faith, we can be more than victorious. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, you know the verse well, but listen to me as I read it to you again. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's an amazing statement. It says, Piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. How close is that? How close is your soul and spirit together? Have you ever thought about that? The Bible makes reference to us being trilogy so they can be divided, which is obvious, but boy, how about that? And of the joints and marrow, the marrow is the inside part of the bone and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know, the Bible knows what you're thinking before you're going to think it. God knows all about you. And he is looking for a heart that wants to seek after him. 
and a heart that tires of sin. And so it's with the word of God. It has power more than, than it can be explained. It, the Bible just changes everything. It's that sharp. It is that weapon that Jesus himself will use when he comes back in Revelation 19 to, to fight the, the enemies at the, at the end of time. So it never once, we just lack in getting it into our life and letting it be effective to us. The specific use Paul made of the weapons is the utmost use of weapons in our spiritual warfare. In other words, you cannot win without using the word of God in prayer. Our mind is the front line of our battle against the devil, against evil. Every thought must be examined through the word of God. And if their thoughts or intentions or whatever seem evil, they must be stopped and brought into the obedience of Christ is what Paul is teaching us. Don't flirt with them. Don't entertain them. Don't let them run their path. And then you feel terrible about where your mind has taken you. Is the moment, he said, be so sharp, be so in tune with the Lord, that when these things begin, you put an end to it. See, with God's authority, you can do that. I've had people say, you mean you can control the way you think? Yes, you can control the way you think. Do you want to? That's one of the questions you need to answer. We are also to use our spiritual weapons against vain thoughts, very similar, that the devil stirs up in our minds. Sometimes you're driving along, you're doing something, and all of a sudden you have the, the most bizarre thought that comes your way. We know where that comes from, but the thought is to not entertain it. Just as in the seriousness of war, we must be on guard against every notion expressed by others in light of the truth. We are to use our spiritual weapons to expose and cast down vain imaginations and simple notions that come from the media, the internet, public education. See, these things many times as you're involved in them, you're watching, you're reading your phone, whatever, and thoughts begin to come your way that are not right. This is what Paul is talking about. You say, Paul didn't have a cell phone. No, but he had a mind, and evil thoughts came his way just as they did to ours. And the simple ideas that pollute the innocence of children, teachers pressuring young boys to imagine themselves as girls, schools are forcing evolution on children and continuing to include information already known to be false in their textbooks. See, it's these areas here, and again, this is not necessarily, this is open, public, but we use our spiritual weapons to cast this sort of thing down, such evil and wrong spirits that promote these wicked ideas and encourage them. We must, because they become accepted as common in our world unless the ever-increasing darkness is expressed with the light of the Lord. You know, you've heard it said, if you tell a lie long enough, people think it's true. And that's what the devil does a lot with all of, I've mentioned just some of these things, but this is what the world is doing. You know, the Bible tells us the opposite of the things I just said. They're wrong. They'll always be wrong. But we as Christian people need to be able to, to expose them. Let me go on. Look at Roman numeral four, our victory. Again, staying with our text. Notice, first of all, this is something we can do. It's very, very sure. It says in verse four, to the pulling down of strongholds. It doesn't imply that we can't do it or we don't have the strength to do it, it implies that, yes, we can do it confidently by faith. The first stronghold that has to be pulled down is our own self-will, the fort of carnal man. In all of us, there is a there's a carnal person. We were saved out of sin, and the more we grow in Christ, the weaker this carnal man gets, but nonetheless, he's still very alive in all of us, and so that's the first stronghold that needs to be completely surrendered to the Lord. The victory comes by dying to self and surrendering unconditionally to the Savior. When our will is conquered 
by his power, we then find his spirit and brought into unity with the Lord Jesus Christ. This gives us victory over sin and the stronghold of Satan. I've known, had people say, Pastor, this bothers me, that bothers me, I can't seem to get over this. Well, this is, this is how you have the victory. Understanding, first of all, the Bible says you can have victory over it. And secondly, this process. Look at verse 5 again. Not only is the victory sure, but it is to be complete. You're to have complete victory. It says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Is that your will? That would be the, the great thing. That's why we started with your own self-will. See, God's not going to take anything out of your life that you don't want him to. Why? Because he didn't make you a robot. He made you a person of free validity. And if you're not willing to have something out of your life, then he's not going to take it out. Okay? So we get back to the question I ask you often. How much do we love the Lord? Do we love him enough to let all of these things go? Let me ask you something I did similar to this morning. I asked you, where were the, were the um, uh, where is Nero? Where were the Roman emperor, emperors today? And you say, obviously, they're gone and dead. Yes, Christ is alive. Same thing with those thoughts that hang on and you, you like those wrong thoughts. Where are they going to take you? Where are they going to lead you? How do they help you? They're vain. They're not going to help you at all. So come to that understanding that you want to have them completely taken care of. When a stronghold is taken, all that is therein is taken prisoner. Thoughts are fugitive things. They must be restrained. They must be guarded. The proverb writer says, for as a man thinketh, so is he. You can know exactly what people are thinking about. Just watch the way they live their lives. Thoughts make up character. Pure thoughts lead to good and noble and wonderful action. It is very important that our thoughts be brought into the captivity and to the will of the Savior. That is what this is all about. See, Satan loves to manipulate your mind and get you to thinking about things that are impossible. Um, I forget who I was talking to. I, I was talking to Brother Cody earlier today. And he said, Pastor, did you hear about somebody that tried to rob the bank? Uh, Washington Federal? I said, you're kidding me. I thought that was Lone Ranger horse and rider days things. He said, no. Guy's 60 some years old. I said, did they catch him? Yeah, the next night in his house. Can, so what possesses somebody to try to rob a bank? Now, if the devil put into your mind, let's go rob a bank, what would you say to him? <laughs> this man didn't do that. He entertained it. He flirted. He says, you know, I could do that. And he's dreaming just as sure as we're staying. He's dreaming on how he's going to spend this money. You say, Pastor, that's foolish. You know that and I know that. But boy, the devil sure tricked him. See, the devil likes to get you thinking about things that are impossible, things that are wrong. He takes you places you don't want to go. And the, see, this is what we're talking about here. And if you do not address this in your Christian walk, okay, it can get very, very strong to the point Paul refers to this as a stronghold. In other words, the devil's got you there because it's never been broken down and it's never been taken care of. Thinking and thoughts require control. Who can guide? Who can restrain and direct them? Under Jesus' control, they are weapons of, uh, of victory. When captured by Christ, your mind is captured by Christ, he will hold them, for thoughts are captured when they are captivated. When you fall in love with the Lord, when you spend more time in your Bible trying to memorize it, trying to think like Jesus, the less opportunity the devil has to put thoughts into your mind. There's no room for his thoughts. He goes someplace else. And so fill your mind with the things of the Lord. We are to bring our thinking into captivity of obedience of Christ by always looking unto Jesus. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. 
the subduer of our will, the captor of our thoughts, the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Don't let your mind go places that it shouldn't because then it's going to cause results that you never dreamed of. I, for some time, Brother Hilt and I and a number of men went out to the OSCI here in town, the prison. We got to talk to different men, and as I listened to them, and it just amazed me. I looked at them, and I said, you shouldn't be in here. He said, Pastor Brown, you're right. And I said, the devil just got you doing things you shouldn't do. He said, I know. See, the Bible's yours to prevent anything like that from ever, ever happening. When we pull down strongholds, the support behind the evil is broken down, leaving those involved without Satan's cover. They are exposed. Hidden things are brought into light. When this happens, when the light of the truth comes in on dark areas, justice and correct, correction can enter in, you see. So when, for example, Christians pull down strongholds such as teachers teaching wrong gender thinking, they are exposed. That's why it's so very important. And as believers exercise their spiritual authority in speaking the truth against Satan, Satan's lies, opposition of wrong and wicked people are exposed. Now, light makes the work of wrong really hard. You don't see people out doing a lot of wrong in the middle of the day. Now, that's getting worse. Why? Because we are not being bold enough and strong enough as Christian people. When God's truth shines in this dark world, those blinded by the darkness can see, you see. In this way, people have their conscience set free from the influence of Satan and lies. Look at number five. What should our action be? Roman numeral five are actions. We are, uh, we are to have spiritual victory through prayer. Brother Allen, I want to apologize to you. Allen said, Pastor, if you bring me your outline, I'll have it up for people. I looked up and I thought, it just dawned on me. I forgot to bring that to Alan. I apologize. I'm asking you to look at something that's not even there tonight, okay? Use your imagination, I guess. I don't know. But too much going on in the world. But anyway, Roman numeral number five, our action. We have spiritual victory through prayer. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, challenges us to enter spiritual prayer and describes our Christian armor. Oh, how important that is there in Ephesians chapter 6. He says to go forward into battle praying with all power, uh, prayer, power and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So some thoughts here. We are to be prayer warriors in Romans chapter 8 verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We can pray in a very meaningful way because the God of the universe dwells within you. If you are a Christian, please understand God, the Holy Spirit, lives within you. You have the power to pray against the devil and the, his work and things you know are wrong. Let me ask you, do you pray against things you know are wrong or do you just let them go by? That's one of the reasons you're here. That's being salty. That's being salty. Let me share a prayer request with you. Would you begin to pray? I have been, but would you begin to pray that the abortion clinic in Salem would be shut down? Would you? Now, don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but would you begin to pray that? Is that possible? Very much so. But see, we need to stand against darkness, things that are wrong. Maybe you have, there's something else that really is bothering you. And boy, is there a choice of them in our world, Okay. Go to praying about them. This is what he's saying, Galatians 5. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Talking about spiritual power, to walk in the Spirit means to live our lives filled with the Holy Spirit. We work at being led by Him, have our minds uh, uh, speak His thoughts in love. Then in Romans 8, 
Again, verses just to give you the assurance that you can do this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. God wants to use us in this work. I think too many times we're not making more of a difference for Christ because we don't get involved. I'm not, did you, I haven't has, have asked anybody to hold up a picket sign. I haven't asked you to throw rocks at anybody. But I have asked you to get on your knees and begin to talk seriously to God who can change these things. He wants to know if we want them changed. Just like in your own personal thinking, do you want thoughts that you don't like? to continue to have a stronghold in your mind. Here's the power to do something about it. So stepping out of that, say, Lord, that really bothers me. That's wrong. The Bible teaches against it. The very first thing you should do is begin to seriously pray about it. That's what the text of the scripture implies. You're given that power, the power of spiritual prayer. In Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Remember, we can't influence the devil if we're walking right alongside of him. We have to be different. We have to have the spirit of God in us to make a difference in this world. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because we live in the Spirit, we are enabled to order the way that we behave so that we fulfill the righteousness of the law and not the lust of the flesh. This is being true salt and light. This is our job as Christian people. We walk spiritually by directing our thoughts one after another toward the things of the Lord and away from the things of the flesh. We move forward spiritually by the way we think. Can I say that again? I hope you heard me. We move forward spiritually by the way we think. See, if you could go and and if you were walking with the Apostle Paul, he pre-thought about everything that he did. The Lord directed him and he was led of the Spirit to do what he did. The same thing works with you. You say, Lord, I want my life to count for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make a difference in this world. I want to do my best to try to close down some of this stuff that the devil seems to be having such a heyday with. Well, you you just begin to pray in the spirit and ask God to begin to do some things, and he will. We move forward spiritually by the way we think. Our mind is the steering wheel of our Christian life. So I just wanted to plant some of these things in your mind here about strongholds. And again, if you say, boy, you know, there's just something in my life I can't seem to overcome and it's not good. Herein is the key that you can have that victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's enabled you to, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, then indeed here, first of all, get your heart right with the Lord, surrendered, and then you ask him to do that which uh, you would have him to do. All things are possible to them that believe. Let's bow our heads together. Our time is raced by tonight. What a wonderful service we've had. Before you uh, leave though or, or close up, think about this. One clear way we know that we are praying in the spirit is that we fervently find ourselves praying for other Christian people. It's very interesting. The way that we know that we're praying in the spirit is by that we're just not saying their name, but we're really engaged in what's burdening my Christian brothers and sisters. That's why we encourage you to have a prayer list. It's unusual. Mrs. Brown and I have a prayer list. Well, a prayer book. And it grows all the time. It's wonderful to cross things off, and we have many, but it it's, it's surprises us how much it grows. It pleases God as we pray one for another. As we do this, God moves then upon our hearts to pray earnestly against things that we may think are bigger or stronger, principalities, powers, 
against the wrong of this world. See, as you're praying for your brothers and sisters and you see the hurt that's happening in their life because of wrong, the Holy Spirit then will move you to begin to pray against that force that has hurt them. <clears throat> it's then that we begin to see strongholds pulled down by his power. I hope that you understand how serious you are in God's sight as a prayer warrior. There is absolutely nothing that the devil fears more than you on your knees. He would rather anything else happen than you get on your knees and you say, Lord, I'm here to talk to you about some things. And first of all, your heart has to be right. Your will has to be surrendered. But when it is, then you begin to talk to God about those things that are on your heart and you see hurting your family or hurting somebody you love and you say, oh God. Open their eyes to see what's happening and call it out specifically and pray against it. See, this is what moves God to change things. Um, this message could go on for hours. I could share with you illustrations about how people have done this in day gone past and things have changed. How is it that things change in such a mighty way? There, you mark it down. There are Christian people that have been praying about this. It's none of my business, but let me urge you to find a little bit more time this week to pray. Every part of your life will go better if you can find a few extra minutes to say, Lord, you know my life is busy, but boy, I need you. And begin to talk to him about what's on your mind. Maybe there's an appointment. Maybe you're worried about your health. Maybe there's a bill, whatever it would be. Talk to the Lord about it. Begin to build spiritual muscle through prayer. Begin to ask God for great things. See, we don't have because we don't ask. He can do all things. What is it again, and I'll close with this, that really is bothering you? Seems to just really bother you and you can't seem to have the victory over it. Did you know God knew all about that? That sacred pen flows from Paul as he writes down how to have victory over pulling down strongholds and casting down wrong and wicked imaginations. How to have victory, to have a clear, wonderful thinking, and then you go forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not always trying to get to the surface, but you're going forward and making a difference for him. Think about these things. Spiritual warfare is so important. We as God's people need to be engaged.